Welcome everybody, this is Information Service Engineering, lecture number three, Natural Language Processing, part two. In this section of the lecture, we are going to talk about the evaluation in the process of natural language processing and especially about how to quantify it based on precision and recall. Okay, so let's start. If we are looking at natural language processing experiments or real world applications, there is a cycle of processes going on which starts usually with the data. So you have some data which is usually some let's say documents or document corpora in natural language and you have a specific task. To fulfill this task what you have to do usually you can't take these texts as they are so you have to pre-process it in a specific way so for example you have to uh, get rid of let's say of line feeds or, or stuff like that and you have probably sometimes also to get rid of uh, punctuation or you have to normalize the text accordingly or you have to strip things away or to filter it in a specific way before it then really comes to training a specific model with the NLP task. So this then is the model that decides for example what type or what category of word we are looking at, what's the sense of a specific word with which entity in a knowledge base can it be connected depending on what kind of NLP task you want to solve. However, in the end you have to quantify your results and this you have to do in an evaluation and this evaluation process tells you whether your model is already sufficiently doing well or whether you can improve it simply by let's say adding more data so you go to data acquisition again or I, by changing the pre-processing adding another pre-processing step or changing something in your pre-processing steps or simply then try to train the model with a different set of parameters however so you see this is kind of an iterative process that goes on and on and on and very important in the end there is the evaluation and this exactly is what we are going to talk about so Again, to remind you, building NLP systems is an iterative cycle. Usually it's composed of human and machine learning, which means the model you are training there, of course, you are using machine learning techniques. However, based on the evaluation, you might know, oh yeah, I have to improve my model in a specific way. So you learn how to either add your data, change your data, further pre-process your data and so on and so on, or change your model accordingly. So this is then composed of human as well as machine learning. Okay, so let's have a look at evaluation. As already told you, how to objectively measure the quality of an experiment, let's say a classification experiment that should find out, you know, whether let's say a specific word, I don't know, is a verb or, a, you know, has a specific meaning or whether a specific sequence of words for example is a person or a location or an organization if we go to natural entity recognition okay how to do this you have your method that you have developed as we have seen in the cycle before and now you have to compare your achieved result with your model against something which is a ground truth a gold standard that had been created let's say with the help of humans that exactly devised what is correct what is not correct so this ground truth usually means you have to invest a lot of manual effort if it's not already let's say available or you have a clever trick to to create it so often it involves the interaction of experts and experts have to judge you know whether this is a correct result or whether this is not a correct result and so on so this usually means um, an investment however it is well invested simply because you can use it then to train an automated method accordingly to work you know um, that uh, this ground truth in the end will be solved also by automatic means in a sufficient way okay however how do we compare now our achieved results with the ground truth okay we can find out okay what is correct what is not correct however we have to distinguish first of all how correct are my results because there will not be right from the start 100 percent overlap with the correct results which means you might either have let's say false positives which means you consider them positives but they are not positive or you can 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 have uh, on the other hand false negatives however 
correctness is one thing. So you determine how many of your de um, determined results are correct. And on the other hand, you want to know whether you have detected all correct results, which means you have to look for completeness. And these two measures can be quantified statistically with the help of two uh, statistical measurements. First is precision for correctness and the other one is recall for completeness. And if you combine both, you achieve the so-called F measure. We will talk about that briefly. Okay, so how do we now compute precision and recall? You do this usually, you conduct your experiment and then you create a so-called confusion matrix. So what's a confusion matrix? A confusion matrix tells you or it contains information about actual and predicted classifications, which are done by your classification system. So in the end, it's a table with two rows and two columns that reports the numbers of false positives, false negatives, true positives, and true negatives. Let's have a closer look here. So we have here on the left side, let's say, um, the actual true and false results. And if you look at the columns, there you have the predicted true and false results. And thereby, of course, the ones that your system predicted as true, there is a specific subset of them that are really true, that are actually true. These are the green ones here, the true positive. However, if your system also determines some to be true, which are actually false, then you have so-called false positives. On the other hand, what your system predicts as being false, but however it's true, actually, these are the so-called false negatives. And on the other hand, your system also predicts some true negatives, which means it predicts them to be false and they are actually false. So these are the true negatives. So this is the confusion matrix. You have here the ground truth, as I told you, these are the actual you know, numbers of things that are true and false with, for your experiment. And then you do your experiment, which predicts something to be true and false. And with the help of this matrix, okay, you get the numbers of the true positives, of the true negatives, of the false positives, and of the false negatives. And from then we can compute precision and recall. We do this with a little experiment. I have here the so-called Beethoven corpus. So you all know famous composer Ludwig van Beethoven in the early 19th century. And we have here a small corpus of texts, which are only simple sentences. And let's have a look at these sentences. So for example, the Andante Favori is a work for piano solo by Ludwig van Beethoven. The other one, the other great passion of the young Mirabenn was the music of van Beethoven or L.V. Beethoven spent the better part of his life in Vienna and so on and so on. So there are lots of statements about Beethoven. And if you look closer at it, for example, here in line number six, you have something which says Beethoven too used his this key extensively in his second piano concerto. So you see there are also typos within there. And of course, Ludwig van Beethoven in this corpus is named in different ways. Sometimes his full name is used, sometimes only his last name and so on. And there are also some sentences which are not referring to Ludwig van Beethoven. Like for example, there is a band called Kampa van Beethoven or Beethoven meanwhile runs after a loose hot dog cart and ends up on a merry-go-round. So this is for sure this, yeah, let's say unbearable movie of the 1980s called Beethoven, where Beethoven was a huge dog. Don't remember this one, but this, of course, was not Ludwig van Beethoven. Okay, so we have here our corpus and what we are going to do now. So the task that we have to do, identify only those sentences that really refer to Ludwig van Beethoven and not to some other Beethoven or let's say to the dog or to the band. If we look at it, we need, of course, then a ground truth. And I did this for you. You see here the first eight sentences truly are about Ludwig van Beethoven. And then the last four sentences that you have here, Johann van Beethoven. So that's probably the father of Ludwig van Beethoven, but it's not Ludwig. Then you have Kemper van Beethoven, which means seems to be kind of band or singer. And then you have Beethoven. So this was the dog also with a typo. And then you had Beethoven hits theaters in April 1992. So that probably was exactly that film I was referring to. So now let's come up with a method to determine what's wrong, what's right. 
we start often with a so-called baseline algorithm, which is purely too simple for the task, but gives you a baseline that you can later on improve on. So what we could do, of course, to refer sentences referring only to Ludwig van Beethoven, we are doing exact string match on Ludwig van Beethoven, on exactly this character sequence. What we see there, we can identify here three among those who are also really correct. So you see here number one, number four and number eight are correct in the actual positive. So these are also our true positives. We also see that all of the actual negatives are considered by our experiment also as being negative. So this means, um, yeah, so we also have all of the true negatives here. However, we didn't find all of the positives here. So two, three, five, six, and seven also refer to Ludwig van Beethoven. But since the exact character string didn't, didn't occur there, we couldn't match it. So therefore we didn't find it. So how well were we doing? First of all, we are creating again the confusion matrix. Okay, so let's have a look. We have here again our actual uh, truth. So, and we have here the predicted truth and among the predicted truth, truth, sorry, we had three lines, one, four, and eight that were really true positive. So this number here would be three. Then we identified nine lines as being negative. So this was two, three, five, six, seven, nine, 10, 11, and 12. And from them, four lines, nine, 10, 11, and 12, they were the true negative. So you see here, we have four true negatives. And on the other hand, we have five lines, two, three, five, six, seven, which are actual positive. These are the false negatives. And since we didn't identify any of the negatives as being true, we don't have any false positives. So this is then our confusion matrix. Let's play around a bit and try to visualize this in another way. So here, for example, with sets in blue here, we have the actual truth. And in yellow here, we have the predicted truth. We have an overlap and this overlap are the true positives, the one that have been predicted as being true and the one that are actually true. So one, four and eight are the true positives. We didn't have any false positives since we didn't predict anything being true, which is not actually true. However, on the other side, in the actual truth, there are five more, two, three, five, six, seven, which we didn't consider as positive. So these are the so-called false negatives. And outside, there are a few which didn't have been, let's say, considered to be true by our experiment as well as by the actual ground truth. So here, number nine, 10, 11, and 12, these are the true negatives. So first thing we try to find out how many of the really true uh, experiments or, 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 or items did we really find in our experiment? So we see we found one, four, and eight. We didn't find two, three, five, six, seven. So to determine the completeness, we simply look at the fraction of the relevant instances that have been retrieved or predicted, which means we are looking at the true positives here and we divide this number simply by all the actual truths, which are the true positives plus the false negatives. So all which are in there, which means this is three divided by three plus five, which is eight, which in the end um, computes to 37.5%. So the recall is pretty small. So it's lower than 50%. It's only 37.5%. So probably we should think of something more sophisticated to do better. However, let's now look at the correctness, which is the pre precision. And this is the fraction of the retrieved instances, which are actually really relevant. So we are looking at the true positives and are dividing them by the number of everything we have predicted to be true, which are the true positives plus the false negatives, which is quite easy here. The true positives are three. And then the one that have been predicted to be true here are also three plus zero. So therefore this equals to one, which means we have a precision of 100%, which is cool. Everything we predicted is correct. However, it's, as we see, only 37.5% of all who should be complete. So the recall is rather low. You see here that we have a problem if we only consider one of these two measurements, 
precision alone can be 100%. Also, you simply have to predict non-negative to be positive, which means if you simply select nothing, then also uh, you would have a precision of 100% because there is no, let's say, wrong answer in there. Yeah, I see. You might say, okay, I have then here uh, as a denominator zero, then this of course wouldn't work at all. However, you see these numbers alone cannot tell you all about the quality of your results. Only these two numbers together. What you now can do, of course, you can put them both together to see, you know, yeah, what's then, let's say, the quality expressed in simply one single number. So let's take the average of both. But simply averaging with an arithmetic mean here does not really work. What we have here is the so-called F measure. The F measure combines precision and recall, and it does it in a way that it computes the so-called harmonic mean of both of them. So typically it's appropriate for situation to take the harmonic mean when the average of rates is desired. We will look later on or in soon how exactly why we take the harmonic mean and not another mean. So let's first have a look how it is determined. So the formula is simply you take the precision and multiply it with a recall and you divide it by the precision plus the recall and then you multiply both by two, which means we have a precision of 100%. We have a recall of 37.5%. So we simply now put it in the formula. We have 100 times 37.5%. So of course we take the real numbers, which means then one times 0 0.375. And then this has to be divided by one plus, and then the recall again was 0 0.375 and then you um, multiply it by two and in the end you end up by 54.5 percent as an f measure it's clear that if precision and recall both are one then also f1 is one as well as if precision and recall are zero then also of course f1 will be or has to be computed to be zero um, one of the things here why exactly the harmonic mean is taken is simply so you see here the harmonic mean how it's really developed and this of course can then be abbreviated if you only have two values values there are two real numbers then you do it exactly the way like the f1 measure here is determined usually precision and recall both they have true positives in the numerator but they have different denominators so you remember recall was true positives plus false negatives and precision was true positives plus false positives the point is there, if you try to average them, it only makes sense to average then their reciprocals so that they have the same denominator. And you do this, this simply then by taking the harmonic mean. So the harmonic mean is, let's, is in the end uh, the reciprocal of the arithmetic mean of the reciprocals of the given set here of observations. So it's the reciprocal of the average mean of the reciprocals. Thereby you do this since, of course, recall and precision both are between zero and one and they have different denominators. Thereby we are doing it the other way around. Okay, so this is a simple explanation why we are not simply taking the arithmetic mean, but we are taking here the harmonic mean for the F measure. Okay, so let's go back to our experience. Experiment. So we said, okay, we try to do a bit better because our original exact string matching to Ludwig van Beethoven did not create sufficient true answers. Okay, relax it a bit. Let's only look for the exact match of Beethoven. Okay, if we do this, I did this already here, as you see here in the experiment, then we identify 10 lines as being positive. So you see this here on the left side so one two three four five seven eight nine ten and eleven then there you see beethoven it's really there and only in two of the lines so in line number six we have beethoven and then in line number 12 we have beethoven they are determined as being negative now the question is is it really better than our old experiment 
because we did not catch all negatives. However, we caught much more positives. You could say, yeah, probably, but we can't really quantify it. To quantify it, of course, again, we have to determine first the confusion matrix and then to determine uh, precision and recall. So for the confusion matrix, we see there that we identified 10 lines as being positive, of which seven lines, one, two, three, four, five, seven, and eight are actual positives. So these are the true positives. And three lines, nine, 10, and 11 are actual negatives, which means these are the false positives. So we have here seven and three. And on the other hand, we determined two as being false. One of them is actually negative. So this is a true negative and one of them is actually positive. So we have one false um, negative. Okay, so let's now have a look at the precision. So for the precision, what we have to say is we have to take the true positives and to divide them by the number of all of them, which we have determined to be true. So this is seven divided by seven plus three, which is 10, and then we have 70%. So you see our uh, precision has already dropped. Okay, now let's have a look at the recall. And at, re at the recall we see here, this is again the true positives divided by how many, so the actual positives, which is seven plus one. So this is seven divided by eight, which is 87.5% of curves. This is much higher than the 37.5% we had before. Now, let's take the harmonic mean of both. And then you see if I insert this in the formula, 70% and 87.5%, we will end up with 77.7%. So this was already much better. However, it's still not 100%. How can we do it better? We can try to do some more sophisticated matching here on that corpus. But how do you do that? So what kind of strings then should we match if we do this by string matching? Of course, it's the, they're not exact string matching. We must relax this a bit or we, we must make this a bit more sophisticated. And one way to do that, you will learn in the next section of the lecture. And these are the so-called regular expressions.